Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucien. Most of you know me from X as Triangle Investor. I'm very pleased to host Mr. John McCluskey on my show. John is a president and chief executive officer and founder of Alamos Gold. Uh, Alamos Gold is a diversified North American producer, companies trading on New York Stock Exchange and Toronto Stock, Stock Exchange under the symbol AGI. John, welcome to my show. It is great to have you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you are a guest for the first time in my show and I have a tradition of asking all my first timers to share their backgrounds. So what is your origin story and tell us how did you start at Alamos and manage to stay all these years at the helm of the company? That's, um, I'll, I'll try to give you the short answer. I, yeah, I, sure. started, I was born and raised in Vancouver, Canada. And as you know, there's a very... Um, a very vibrant uh, community there, mining community. In the um, in the nineteen eighties, it was um, there was a tremendous entrepreneurial spirit there. There was a, a half a dozen very high profile, extremely successful mining entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and um, they they were creating some really exciting investment opportunities and and making investors lots of money. And one of them was a gentleman named Chester Miller. Uh, he had a, a, a major exploration success in the 1970s called Afton Mines. Yes. A mine we, you've probably heard of. It's still in production to this day. Yeah. Well, he was, he, was the, he was the fellow who found that in uh, the early 1970s. And so um, it was a very exciting discovery. He was, he was taken out by Tech Corporation for one, it was one of the biggest uh, takeouts of a junior um i was going to say up to that time but probably ever if you if you were to put it into into current dollar terms it was probably in the neighbor, neighborhood of 200 dollars a share mm, uh, and nice. it started as a penny stock so it went from pennies to uh i think it was nearly 50 dollars a share where where they were taken out but anyway he he managed to um uh latch onto another idea and um, that idea was something brand new. It was open pit heap leaching. And um, this had only been patented by the U.S. Bureau of Mines in the early 1970s. Uh, he saw a number of operations in Nevada at that time, particularly the, the Placer operations. Um, this was before they were Placer Dome. Mm -hmm. um, he, he saw what they were doing and, and the, he figured out how it worked. And and he thought, geez, that's something you could do on a small scale. So a junior company could theoretically become a producer without have without having to raise vast sums of capital. Yeah. And um, he pursued that concept, and that was the origins of a company called Glamis Gold. And I went to work for Glamis in uh, in 1983 when I was right out of school. I, I'd studied history and link and, and, and English literature. I didn't study mining. Um, but in the early 1980s, uh, there was a recession on and life was uh, fairly difficult in Vancouver for for young students coming out of school. And um, I would have taken pretty much any job. So I, I joined a mining company without really recognizing uh, I was I was starting a, a, a lifelong career. Let's put it that way. But in the few years that I was with Klamis, uh, you know, by 1989, uh, it had grown tremendously. I'd, I'd done very well. And at that point, I left Glamis and I started to do, again, more entrepreneurial things. And um, and I did well. And as it would turn out in the mid 90s, Chester approached me and he said, why don't we start something together? And we actually started a little company called Alamos Minerals, mm -hmm. which we brought public in 1996. And um, you, you might remember how bad a year that was. Commodities all plunged and the Vancouver Stock Exchange disappeared and so forth. Probably over a thousand listings were wiped out. But we, we managed to keep, keep Alamos alive as a little, almost like a little <laughs> shell. And we kind of carried it through those down years from, from 96 through 2001. And then in 2001, you could sense that there was a turn coming in the market. And at that point... He and I got together for lunch and we said, we should do something with Alamos now. And the first thing we did was to um, uh, secure an option on, on the Malaros project in Mexico, where, where again, Placer Dome, as it would turn out, had poured in nearly $50 million. 
we we entered into an option agreement where we could buy it for $10 million plus a royalty. And that was the beginnings of the company. And um, there was another junior that owned part of it. And by the time we took that junior over and merged the two companies together, um, we had 100% of the asset. That was February 2003. And that's when I officially became the CEO of the company. But uh, so I, 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 my uh, association with Alamos goes back to the, the mid 90s. Uh, but the uh, yeah my my official title sort of started in February of of, of two thousand three and in February two thousand three we had a fifteen million dollar market valuation and, and here today we are we now twenty three years million. later with much higher valuation and yeah. you still at the helm of the company that's yeah. a great background definitely. Uh, John, gold is once again becoming one of the hot topics. Prices are at the highest level ever. What's going on, John? I know we have instability, we have economic issues, etc. But what are the main reasons for rising gold prices? And uh, do you believe that we are now in one sustainable longer term growth in gold price? So the first thing I would say is that um, uh, hopefully everybody has an opinion because that's what makes life interesting. But yeah. um, what my opinion is worth, uh, you, you you judge for yourself. Sure. Um, well, I, with your experience, I'm, it means a lot to me. Well, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to figure out the world like everybody else is, and um, you know, I'm I'm running a gold mining company. I obviously believe in the commodity. I've believed in it for a exactly. long, long time. And by and large, I've, I've been right. I, you know, if you if, if you gamble uh, ten million dollars on a project uh, when gold is under three hundred dollars an ounce, you're either crazy or you're onto something. It's one or the other. Yeah. And you know, I couldn't even get any anybody to put up the money to to pay the first option payment to Placer Dome, and so I had to I mortgaged my house to get the money. And not many people believe in in a project or, or a commodity to that extent, but but that's where that's where I come from. I, I I knew that despite all the press at that time, you know, gold was finished, not necessary anymore, just a, a barbaric relic from from the ancient past and no no further use. I I just never believed that for a second. You know, I studied history, and um, it doesn't take you uh, very long to. Uh, appreciate that you know over time you know the the civilizations rise and fall and the the empires rise and fall and um we, we you know we, we we've we've seen it uh in, in not too distant past i mean you look at the british empire in the middle of the 19th century the sun never set on the british empire it was one of the the richest and most powerful that the world had ever seen and nothing would ever rival it no now it's the americans and uh you know you could argue that uh you know the peak of american uh was probably uh 1989 1990 about the time that the berlin wall fell and and russia fell right after it uh, you could argue that was pretty much the peak of their power and what's been happening since and i would say that um that the hold that the u.s has on the world it's still very very significant it's still by far and away the most prominent economic economic power in the world and i think it's going to stay the, the most prominent power for a very long time to come but it's not going to be the only power yeah and this is what we're seeing we're seeing a change in the uh in the world order so to speak as uh as china rises as both uh, an economic and a military power and it creates its own set of alignment uh, that that uh, effectively challenged the united states that that's happening that's just not controversial to say that whether you like it or not it's happening and um one of the things that they have not been able to ch challenge is the supremacy of the uh, of the us dollar uh up till now and uh, one of the reasons is um you know that there was such a uh a powerful system set up at the end of the second world war that used the S the U S dollar as its base. And it was meant to stay that way for a very, very long time. And it has, it succeeded um, in, in an amazing way when you, when you consider 
uh, not only did it uh, accomplish the revival of uh, of Europe, um, but you know the Pax Americana has has basically served the world, you know, for the last seventy years, um, and it's been by and large a, a very positive force. But it's um, things are changing, and um, and other powerful forces are rising in the world. You know, the, you know China, India. The, 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 those countries have over a billion people and um and they struggled for well china for a century let's say and and uh, in india for at least that long that's changing now the, these these powers are rising and the, the, there's a yeah there's a major change going on in the world and gold is playing a part of all that it's not just you know your typical you know commodity rise and fall that we've seen that i've seen for the last 40 years there is a significant change going on. So do I think we're just in some sort of a temporary rally? Well, yeah, gold's always going to look like a sawtooth uh, when you look at the chart. It's always going to be up and down and up and yeah. down and up and down. But, you know, the trend for the last 20 years has been straight up. I mean, when, when I took on the, the role of CEO in 2003, the gold price was $320 an ounce. Now it's $2,400 an ounce. Yeah. I mean, that's a dramatic rise in price. And it hasn't happened overnight. It's happened over time, but the, there's been a steady rise, right? An up and down chart, but steadily rising over those decades. And I think that is about to accelerate here because some very significant things have changed lately. Um, you know, in my first 20 years in the business, the whole, the whole story was central bank selling. And they were selling so aggressively in the 90s, they had to bring in the Washington agreement just to, just to create a, a steady, more more balanced market yeah well now it the gold price is being driven by central bank buying and and that's uncontroversial to say you can look at that data it's the world gold council actually tracks that data and very strong central bank buying is uh has been the main impetus behind the gold price which is why you've seen the commodity move and not the equities yeah they're yeah. not buying gold equities yeah. they're buying gold so why will the gold equities eventually respond? Because a higher gold price will mean better margins for producers and they will start generating the numbers that will start to really impress investors. And this is why I think you're going to see an eventual uh, uptick in the, um, you're starting to see it already, an uptick in the in the in the gold shares yeah agreed and especially with the, the equities i believe that the juniors explorers really didn't have any reward on the market on the other hand maybe developers and the producers had some like for example your stock is performing be much better recently but that is thanks to your six project in your portfolio. I would like to cover them all with overviews and updates. You have actually, you have three development projects and three producing mines. And we can add another one, the Megino mine, which is a part of a friendly acquisition of Argonaut Gold. Actually, I would like to cover this transaction. How did this transaction happen? And what are the most important synergies here? Well, by the time we arrived in um, in the Metropolitan Gold Belt, by the time we acquired the Island Gold Project in uh, t at the end of 2017, um, Argonaut was already there. Mm -hmm. they, they had previously they had acquired the uh, Magino Project, um, and and they'd been working on it, you know, drilling it and doing feasibility studies in one thing or another. Uh, we were um, we took over a producing gold mine called Island Gold, but it was it was fairly small, doing about 100,000 ounces of gold a year. Mm -hmm. But we bought it not because of its um, its production, um, although it was profitable. But that wasn't the main thing that attracted us. What attracted us was we saw the potential for that orb body to grow significantly. And we thought that, um, that the um, potential was by and large being missed. And that turned out to be the case. I mean, it's it's nice to look back from 2024 back to 2017 and, um, and and see what's happened. But then it's always, you know, the market will look on it as a risk. You think that? Well, we're not so sure you're right about that. So the day we announced the acquisition of Island Gold, 
Richmond Mines. Our stock dropped 16% that day. And over the course of the year that followed, it dropped 38%. So the market clearly did not like this transaction. Yeah. But we stuck to our guns and we were investing roughly $20 million a year in exploration. And where it brought us is today, uh, as, uh, as our last mineral inventory update, which was um, in February, we we're sitting at 6.1 million ounces. And that's net of a million and a half ounces of depletion. So we are showing not just replacement of the reserves we're mining, but steady and very, very strong growth. The other interesting aspect of this is that the grades have improved. They were about nine grams a ton when, when we acquired it. It's about 11 grams a ton now. And as you go to depth, you can see from our block model that the grade is actually increasing as we go to depth, which is the dream, I suppose. And um, the other important element of it is um, we're uh, investing in a big expansion of, of Island Gold. So we're going to take it from, we've already expanded it in two small steps. We, we took, took it to about 150,000 ounces a year or so. But the next step is to take it to about 300,000 ounces a year. And that investment is going on right now. And in fact, the point we were getting to, we were just getting to the point this year where we would start the heavy spending on the mill. You know, we last year it was all about getting the shaft established. So we built the head frame, we started the shaft. We're down about 240 meters on the shaft. Well, by the end of the year, it'll be over a thousand meters. And by the time we're done in early 26, it'll be down to about 1,350 meters. So that's a big part of what we're doing. But the other, the other part of it was a mill expansion. And that we don't have to do anymore. So one of the key drivers for the moment as far as you know, why did we do the deal now and not years ago is, you know, we had an opportunity to watch Magino develop. They, they sunk roughly a billion dollars into uh, infrastructure and, um, and development of that project. And among other things, they built a 10,000 ton per day mill, brand spanking new mill. And they have a tailings facility that can accommodate up to like 160 million, 160 million tons of tailings. Well, that is fantastic. I mean, that that is a very tough thing to do. It takes years and years and years to permit that. Yeah. So the optionality of having all that permitted tailings capacity, they also have permitted milling capacity to take the mill production up to 35,000 tons a day. So it's only a 10 right now, but you could go much higher. And we saw on a combined basis, you had the ability then uh, you had the option, if you went, because it comes down to optionality, right? right. To to really expand this camp. So they, had, if you if you add up the total ounces and mineral inventory in all categories, uh, between the both projects, it's eleven and a half million ounces now, which is that's a giant, right? And um, so you, what the idea is to produce from an underground mine on one side and an open pit mine on the other but feed all that ore into the same mill. So okay. you're essentially unitizing it. So you, you're, you're taking what, what right now is, you know, would be two separate mines and you're combining it into one operation. And there's tremendous synergies in that. And by the time you work them out, there's um, $25 million a, a year in, in annual savings just by joining the two operations. And immediately there was there was about $140 million in synergies from our side because we didn't have to invest in a new mill and we didn't have to invest in a tailings lift, which was scheduled for this year, which would have been about $20 million. Mm -hmm. So okay, what there the was more than half a billion dollars in synergies on a combined basis, which yeah. is pretty extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really sounds great. Uh, what about other production projects you have uh, all together? What are the what are the company's production plans for 2024? So just setting the acquisition aside, because we'll we'll eventually have to account for that after closing, and I expect yeah. it's going to close in July. So we'll probably get half a year of production from uh from magino but just that aside uh we were going we we're scheduled to produce just over five hundred thousand ounces from our operations this year that's from island gold from young davidson and the mulattoes project in mexico 
what what will be the cost? Uh, the costs of production are declining when we are going yeah, the, when we are the, moving they're, forward. They're fairly flat this year between this year and last. The we start to see the big um, big cost reduction coming in 2026 when we're completed the shaft at Island Gold. Then we're going to see a significant reduction in costs, but. Our costs are going to be fairly flat, but they're they're very um, very low cost on on a relative basis. We're sort of sitting at around eleven hundred and fifty dollars all in sustaining costs. Okay, uh, what about your development projects? Uh, you have a Lynn Lake project. Uh, can you give us give us a short overview of the project and what are you currently doing over there and what are the plans? Well, Lynn Lake is about two two and a half million ounces. Um, it's growing. We're, we're drilling two other deposits right now called burnt timber and liquid. So those are going to continue to grow. Uh, we have a, a permits in place now from the federal and provincial governments to start development there. We're intending to start development next year. Um, we've already completed the feasibility study. It's basically a $630 million project that will build a mine to produce basically uh, averaging 170,000 ounces of gold for like a 17 year mine life. Okay. When do so, you expect the first ounce of gold uh, out of the, uh, when do you expect to produce the first ounce of gold? Right. Well, I got to get the mine built first. So assuming we're, assuming we build it in uh, over In a perfect world, I mean. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to mine it in 25 and 20, uh, pardon me, build it in 25 and 26. And we should see the first production coming out in 27. Okay, okay. Uh, what about Quartz Mountain project in USA? Same so Quartz question. Quartz Mountain, is, it's a, that's a project that we acquired for, oh, I'm going to say uh, about $10 million or so. Again, one of those things that we just picked up at the bottom of the market. Um, we, we've done some drilling there. <laughs> Sorry. And we've we've drilled off roughly it's just over a million ounces at about one gram, but it's open pit heap leachable. Um, it's a very um, it, I, I think it's a very interesting project. But it's at this at this when we acquired it a, a number of years ago, probably in 2013 or so when we acquired it. Um, you know, it looked like a, a another interesting step for us to take. But in 2015, after we merged with Orico and we brought in Young Davidson. All our our attentions focused on a much bigger project there, and uh, then we subsequently acquired Island Gold and so forth. And unfortunately for our project in in Oregon, there it just got kept it kept on getting pushed to the back of our priority list, and and it it, it more or less sits there now. It's it's a relatively low priority for us. Um, probably something we we would sell. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than develop. Okay. Uh, Turkish development projects, what's the plan there? No plan. <laughs> uh, we don't have much to uh, to do in Turkey, uh, <laughs> given that uh, the Turkish government did not <laughs> renew our licenses after we, we, we basically acquired those projects for about $90 million. And then we spent um, another $150 million on, on developing them. We drilled off about 3 million ounces. We um, subsequently um, completed feasibility study on the Crosley project, started construction <laughs> on that project in um, in 20, towards the end of 2017. And in 2019, when our licenses came up to, for renewal, Turkey did not renew them. So we, um, we own our, we own those assets in Turkey through a, a Netherlands subsidiary, which has a reciprocal treaty with Turkey, a very important one. And so under the um, the treaty in the Netherlands, we are suing the Turkish state to um, essentially receive compensation for mm -hmm. our investment. So we'll see how that goes. But we wrote the projects down to zero a couple of years ago. And uh, so that means we, we we wrote down that's the first write down we ever took two hundred twenty million dollar write down, but I'm expecting to get substantially more than that in a, in a settlement. So the tribunal, um, the the first hearing will take place this fall, and we'll go from there. We'll see how it goes.
Okay, uh, you're also operating in Mexico. Can you tell me more as uh, about Mexico as a jurisdiction? How is the current situation with the government and local support for gold mining? From yeah, there's a lot of a lot of noise coming out of uh, of Mexico. I can certainly appreciate that. We've been there a long time. I'm, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the discussion, we. We started looking around in Mexico, Chester Miller and I, in the mid-1990s. So I've watched a lot of things unfold over that period of time. Uh, we we saw some very good years at the beginning when the Mexican government was strongly encouraging Canadian investment into the mining industry of Mexico. We were part of the first wave of companies that, that pursued that through the acquisition of Mulatos. Mulatos has been a fantastic mine. You know, we've we've produced nearly four million. What we we've mined about four million ounces of gold. We've probably produced close to three million ounces of gold. We've made about five hundred million dollars in free cash flow. We've probably paid three hundred or more million dollars in taxes to the Mexican government. I mean, that mine has been great for everybody: the local communities, the government, our shareholders. It's been it's been amazing and. When we first started, it only had a six-year mine life. That was in 2005. You know, here we are, in, in, and in, in 2023, we had our most profitable year at that mine. I think the mine generated about a $140 million in free cash flow that year, last year. So yeah. it was the most profitable of all of our operations. And, you know, Mulatos continues to just surprise the market. I mean... Leaki Grande, the mine that we're in production now, is is doing very, very well. We're having another great year there. But we've also found a new deposit, which is the first indication that we're making a transition now from mining near surface oxides. Now we're going to be going underground and mining high grade sulfides. So the first deposit that we found is uh, it's called the PDA. And PDA roughly sits at about a million ounces grading almost six grams. And that I think we're going to be able to mine very easily uh, at probably a rate of a uh, hundred thousand ounces a year. And with the intention of, you know, starting out with a 10 year mine life for our first underground operation, but there are sulfide gold opportunities throughout that district. Um, we know that because uh, on a few occasions, you know, we drilled down beneath the oxides into into sulfide gold, but we just didn't uh, we didn't take it because we didn't have a mill. Now we're building the mill. I think everything's going to change. So underneath our old cerro prolonged deposit, for example, we hit we hit a drill hole that that was basically uh, uh, fifteen grams of gold over fifty five meters. That's a great drill hole. Yeah, but, definitely. But and John, what is the cost of building a new mill? Let's say with the capacity you are now building uh, in Mexico. Well, we're just we're just costing all that out now. As probably before the end of the uh, of the third quarter, we're going to have um, all that data compiled. It would have been ready already, but we've been pretty focused on the on the acquisition of Magino. Yeah. Um, so we we will expect to have that out before the end of the third quarter. And I think what you're going to see is it's, it's going to come in well under a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's not just for the mill, that's for the mill and for the underground development, the whole project will probably bring it in for a hundred mil under a hundred million dollars. And one of the reasons why it's so cheap is because, you know, we can utilize a lot of the existing infrastructure that's there. We already got the full, the full crusher uh, capacity in place. Yeah, and uh, that helped. Yeah, definitely. so it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be pretty cheap to develop it. Yeah, uh, John, company has paid dividends for fifteen consecutive years, during which time uh, three hundred and thirty million or something like that was returned to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Uh, what is the plan on that front? Do you plan maybe to raise dividends as your profit rises with higher gold prices and lower cost of production. What's the plan here? Well, we, we have this, uh, our, our concept behind asset allocation it looks something like this. You know, we want to take about one third of the money we make and pay, pay it back to shareholders in, 
in dividends or share buybacks. We take about one third and invest it in growth and about one third and invest it in strengthening our balance sheet so that we can be opportunistic like we like you've seen lately with the acquisition of Magino. And um, if you look at us over time, we, we effectively do that. Um, from time to time, the, the money might allocate more in one direction than the other. Like right now we're, we're invested more heavily in growth. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of keeping the dividend fixed, but you can imagine what, by the time we finish this, this capital spending phase, and we're starting to derive all that expanded production from our mining operations, then we're going to raise the dividend. Sounds like a right approach. I would agree on that. Uh, John, balance, how is the balance sheet for, for the, of the company? How are you positioned with balance sheet? Well, we've been uh, we're debt free and uh, have been so for for most of our uh, our time as a company we've been debt free. We take on debt from time to time. When we did the Orico merger, for example, in 2015, we assumed about 300 million in debt from the Orico side, but we paid that off in 2017 mm -hmm. and went debt free again. And we've uh, we've maintained that ever since. Um, we probably have. I'm guessing about $150 million in cash on the balance sheet right now um, after just having made an investment of $50 million in uh, into Argonaut. We had to do a private placement into Argonaut to give them working capital to sort of get through the, the last phase here as um, uh, prior to them taking them over. Yeah. So we have a very strong balance sheet. We have, uh, we have lines of credit for over $500 million. So our liquidity is is really excellent. Just quick return on the transaction. That is some 34 premium uh, based on Argonaut and Alamos closing price uh, on March 26. Uh, my question is, is that approximately in line with the usual M&A levels in the gold mining space? I, I think it was a, a reasonably good premium to pay. I mean, give, given if you looked at what the share prices of Argonaut had done over four years, they'd basically gone from, from $4 a share down to 30 cents. And yeah. our share price had gone from, you know, $9 a share to 20. Um, you know, we were getting a lot of, of leverage from our, our outstanding performance relative to the difficulties that they were having. So, you know they, they you know their company had gone from over a billion dollars in valuation down to you know a few hundred million and um i i think it was fair to pay a premium um and i think it was a, a very reasonable premium to pay um but there, there, there there's no one number that is the answer you know each each situation has to be looked at on its own merits and sometimes yes, agreed, agreed. sometimes you can justify a small premium sometimes a big one sometimes no premium the first deal that was done on a non-premium basis was when we merged alamos with Arico. it was there was a non-premium deal yeah depends on the market depends on the stock depends on the timing i agree totally yeah. with that uh, final question, John, news flow from the company in the upcoming period, from which project, when can we expect some news flow going forward? Well, we, we have no shortage of news coming out, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, we've got um, we've got um, a, a, a lot of projects underway. We, we've got a $60 million expiration budget this year, and uh, we're drilling everywhere. We're drilling on the PDA deposit in Mexico, we expect that's going to get bigger. Uh, we continue to drill at Island Gold, and we're getting great results there. So you'll see further further uh, news coming from Island. We're also drilling at our Young Davidson project, which uh, you know it's been producing since we completed the expansion of Young Davidson in 2020. It's been generating 100 million in free cash flow a year. And um, and it's maintained about a three and a half million ounce uh, reserve, but we see potential there to uh, expand that further. And and we've we've been looking at um, look finding higher grades in the hanging wall and foot wall of that zone. We're in one of the most famous structures in the world, the Cadillac Larder Lake Break, and it's the, the potential for uh, higher grade deposits is really quite significant and. 
they're difficult to find because they, they tend to be under a very thick layer of cover called the Huronia cover. And uh, around where we are, it's it's hundreds and hundreds of meters thick, so you can't really see much from surface. But now we're down into the mine. You know, the, our, our mining infrastructure goes down 1,500 meters, so we can access uh, places to drill from underneath that cover and drill laterally right across the zone and into the hanging wall and float wall. And that's what we're doing now, and we're having some success. So you know you're bound, you're going to see news flow from a lot of places. We've got the um, we've got the PDA uh, mill uh, study that we'll publish this quarter. Plus, um, you, you'll see news coming out on uh, Lynn Lake. We're drilling both the bird, bird timber and linkwood projects in Lynn Lake, and um, I, you know you can just see there's a, a lot of direction from from which we're we're going to be generating news, and of course the regular. Quarterly updates on production. We're having another really great year from a production perspective. So, and of course, with these higher gold prices, I think everybody is going to be looking to, uh, especially the quarter we're in now, you're going to really start to see margin expansion and uh, much, uh, much, much more in the way of revenue and, and profits. Okay, so investors should stay tuned. Oh, got it. Uh, that was John McCluskey, President, uh, Founder, and Chief Executive Officer of Alamos Gold. John, thank you very much for coming to my show. It was a great chat, and I hope we will catch up sometime soon again. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure.